Thanks so much for joining tonight uh, for the Think Realty Plus webinar. We do these calls uh, frequently for our Think Realty Plus program. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Eddie Wilson. I'm the founder of Think Realty. I founded Think Realty in 2013, mainly because I wanted to bring content to real estate investors. I'm a third generation real estate investor. Um, and the things that I was able to hear uh, sitting around the dinner table with my father and grandfather, I wanted to bring to the general marketplace to those uh, that wanted to find success in real estate. And that's why we started Think Realty in 2013. Um, so we're 11 years old. Uh, still, we have a magazine on the shelves of Barnes & Noble, and you can also order that as well as uh, we have conferences uh, two times a year. And we also have a virtual conference coming up this year. I uh, would love for you to join us for any of those. Um, by way of introduction, uh, Greg Slaughter is one of our resident experts. Uh, Greg's been with us for quite some time. He's not a stranger to the platform. Um, and Greg has taught various topics throughout the years. Um, he's taught a lot on uh, fix and flip, buying rental properties, uh, and probably most recently, he taught a lot uh, on the platform uh, about um, property management. And he's become really uh, one of the foremost experts in property management. But I think there's this underlying theme, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, which makes Greg good at all the things that he does. And Greg is a systems guy. Um, I'll let him give it a quick intro here in just a minute. But Greg comes from the McDonald's Corporation, where they um, have made a business out of systemizing everything so that you can pull someone off the street, you can pay a minimum wage, and they can still make the same great hamburger that anyone else can. And uh, that's where <laughs> got all of his success. And uh, he then translated that into real estate by buying hundreds of rental properties, renovating them across multiple states, uh, building a system to help uh, property manage it and get the most efficiency out of his business. And so Greg's just a, he's a systems guy. And uh, and then now uh, he has built another system that we're going to talk about uh, tonight uh, that I know will be very, very helpful for you. Because many of the real estate investors that are out there, you guys are entrepreneurs. You are those that are searching for uh, freedom. You're searching for happiness. You're searching for joy. You're searching for wealth. Um, and Greg has systemized all of those things with this new program. So, Greg, thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Some may argue about the quality of the food at McDonald's, though. So, <laughs> the systems may be great, but I think there's a lot of people, probably including myself, that's probably not a good fan of the food. But we well, digress there. <laughs> yeah. It's still the same. You know, you get a you get a hamburger in Phoenix, and it's the same hamburger in Chicago. You know, so that is true. Yeah. yeah. And now it's not the same. Run that business. It's not the same hamburger that you get. In China, though, in China, it actually does taste better. I don't know why, but I think they use real meat in China or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, obviously, we've had you talk about a lot of real estate in the past, but uh, over the past uh, year or so, you've been building out a new program. And so before we jump into that program, if you don't mind, just give brief uh, history of your, you know, give us the 30,000 foot view on Greg Slaughter and all that you've been doing in the past, you know, 15, 20 years. All right. Well, the first 15 years, as you stated, I was with McDonald's Corporation. So I started there when I was 17. I was running my own restaurant when I was 19. When I left there in 2002, I was responsible for the entire west part, western part of the United States. I oversaw seven states specifically. I was responsible for all of the restaurants and their management teams. And I got sick and tired of corporate America. I knew, always knew I wanted to invest in real estate. So we started investing in real estate in 1999, got our first rental property and left Corporate America in 2002. And just since then I've done, we we're trying to figure out exactly how many, cause I stopped counting literally 15 years ago or 10 years ago or whatever. But I think it's somewhere between 1500 and 2000 real estate transactions I was involved with. I'm oh. guessing it's somewhere around 1800, but I don't know, I'm just guessing at this point, but it's somewhere in that range. Uh, being involved either the purchase or the sale or the resale or wholesaling or whatever, it's some form of a transaction with real estate. And, uh, and my passion was cash flow. So I really focused hard on the buying single family homes and fixing them up and renting them out, generating cash flow. And that's pretty much what I've done. And now I'm doing my passion, uh, which is helping helping individuals to achieve what they desire. Yeah. So <clears throat> you have achieved a lot of success. Um, I know a lot of people look to you for guidance and coaching and help in that area. Um, do you mind just kind of giving us the overview of the new program you built? Um, and then we'll start to break that down a little bit on the call. 
Right. Okay. So, so what happened was, let me kind of give a backstory because it'll make the, it'll make a lot more sense. So from all the way up until about 2010, when I left Corporate America in 2002, up until 2007, I took all my quote unquote systems, I implemented into real estate. We're doing really well on paper. We we're quote unquote millionaires. And we thought we were retired and we thought we were doing great. But then when the crash hit in 2007, uh, it wiped us out. We had to start over. So I found myself in 2010, dead broke and taking reflecting on my life that I literally was starting over. It was almost like I was back in high school and I had to start over. And reflecting back, I'd realized I had spent, I was, a, I was an achiever. So I was one of those, I worked every holiday. I worked six, seven days a week. I was on all the time because I was one of those where you set big, massive goals. You do whatever it takes to, to accomplish them. You know, you, you embrace the suck. You never quit. You do whatever it takes to achieve those goals. You achieve those goals and then you set new goals, bigger goals, and you move on those goals and you're you're on this ever-ending loop. And that was me. I, and I wore that like a badge of honor. I mean, I was so proud of everything I accomplished. But then here I was in mm. 2010 filing for bankruptcy, dead broke and wondering, what did I just do? I mean, I literally spent my entire life at that point in time, I was 44. I'd spent my entire life at that point pretty much sacrificing everything in order to achieve this dream life that I was chasing. And now I have nothing. And so that really, I mean, the bankruptcy is bad enough, but when you come to realization that you've wasted or felt like you wasted majority of your life up to that point, then you've got to figure out how to do things differently. And so that's what I did. I started trying to determine is like, I'm not willing to do that anymore. I'm not willing to sacrifice my life anymore. I want to live my life now and not wait for 20, 25, 30 years. And so I took my systems background and I started trying to figure out how, how to do that. And literally what I'm sharing today is what I figured out over the last 10 years, 15 years, since 14 years, I guess, since that day, as we were able to figure little things out, implement it, some work, some didn't. And then at this point, I've got it down to a science where we were able to take myself or take anyone and go from basically what I like to say, convert them from an achiever to a thriver, because it's two different thought processes, two completely different individuals. When you go from achiever to a thriver, which is what I like to call myself today. So I'm more of a thriver. I'm no longer an achiever. So um, because you're a systems guy, um, you've built a system to try to get them to a place of thriving. Um, do you mind just kind of unpacking? Let's, let's start like, general overview because i know you've got a an acronym and it's like got all these like <laughs> tears to it because you you are a systems guy um but if you don't mind just kind of break that like at least give us the the top view and then let's start kind of jump jumping into some of these okay so when i realized that i want didn't want to be an achiever anymore and i wanted to accomplish everything in my life i wanted good health i wanted a good family uh, I wanted to travel the world. We set a goal to go through all seven continents and and see all 50 states. I The first thing I went to is like, okay, I got to increase my productivity. That's the first thing that I went to. And I think that's the first thing every achiever goes to naturally is how do I become more efficient? How do I right. get more things done, right? And so I went on this quest to start studying everything on how to become more efficient. And what I realized is that I was already pretty efficient, I had already taken the time magic courses. I already knew how to delegate. I already knew how to hire people. I hired literally thousands of people in my life. So I didn't really get any assistance from that. And what I realized from studying other people and figuring out myself is that productivity is a lot more than just efficiency. There is also an effective. And I never understood the effective part. And I don't think achievers really understand the effective part of it. And once I started honing in on being more effective rather than being efficient, then that's when I started seeing the results. And then when I combined the two, that's when I really, really blew up, I guess, when I really achieved the success. And I like to call that extreme productivity. So what, that's what I like to focus on. That's what I, I teach or whatever is extreme productivity. And then under that is I have the six, six step system is six steps to thrive, which is the acronym you were talking about because thrive is an acronym. And so by following those six steps, it's kind of like the operating system of being a thriver it's the ABCs, I guess, of a new language. And then you get, just got to learn how to speak that language. And you just add, add on nouns and verbs and sentences and you just kind of learn it. So it's an operating system you should just work on. But the six steps is really the basic foundation 
of how to how to thrive. So we can go through the six steps if you want, or we can do that later, or we can do whatever you wish. Before we jump into the six steps, um, how would you define success in your own life now? I mean, because a lot of us, um, I myself included, you know, um, we are achievers by nature. I mean, most people that are going to be on this platform, they're achievers, right? Like they're driven. They, they, a lot of them have a W2 job and they're also doing real estate, right? Or they've left their W2 job like you did and they're doing real estate full time. And so it's, you know, we all get into that hamster wheel you're talking about. And it's like, we're climbing that mountaintop and we get almost to the top of that peak and we realize, oh wait, there's another one that's bigger right beyond this. And then we hop onto that mountain and we start climbing that one. What do you define or how do you define success today in your own life? Okay, that's a great question because that's actually one of the things that I teach is because the definition of success is gonna help determine where you are. I like to say, first of all, there's the 80-20 rule. So I say 80% of the world is what I call survivors. And then 20% of the world is basically achievers. And then within that 20%, you always have the small, you have the 1% rule, you have the one percenters. That's what I call the thrivers, the thrivers of 1%. And one of the things I've noticed, and I'm still learning every single day as I study more and more and more people, but one of the things I've determined is, is the way you look at success and the way you define success, I mean, truly from within your heart and not what your ego and your brain tells you, but the way you define success is going to help you fit into one of those three categories. So a survivor, they don't really, their, their definition of success is meeting their basic needs. So they live a good life as long as they can pay their bills and have good, good health and have, you know, have be married, you know, so that's basically a survivor An achiever, the way they define success is accomplishing goals, right? Their success is all about accomplishing a future goal. If I accomplish that goal and then a new goal and the new goal. So they're always focused on the future and achieving those goals. And that's where I was. And to your point where most achievers are. From a thriver's point of view, the definition of success for me today and has been for the last 10 years is where am I today? And I know that what I do today is going to determine my success in the future. So I'm not worried about my future success. I'm not worried about those big goals. I'm worried about what is my purpose? What, if, and what am I enjoying? What am I having fun? Do I have fulfillment? And I'm worried about some other things other than future goals. Very good. So in that 1% where I am today that determines your future um, is there kind of a quotient that you're, you know, working through? You talked about like fulfillment, like how do you, how do you know that you are fulfilled? How do you, how do you know if you're getting a sense of fulfillment versus just achievement? Okay. So the, the great question. So when you're an achiever, uh, when you achieve a goal, you do have that sense of achievement because it's almost like a dopamine hit, right? It's like, you feel good because you've hit that goal. But then what happens is as soon as you hit that goal, the reason why they immediately go to another goal is because that's already worn off. You've already hit that goal, right? So I need another dopamine hit. Then I need another dopamine hit. It's almost like an addiction. And that's why they get in a loop and why they continue to chase goal after goal after goal. So you know you're not getting fulfilled when you constantly feel the need to have to go start a new goal. When you feel the need, when it's almost like a drug addict, I have to have another drug, Right. So that's kind of the way I look at it from an achiever's point of view. From a thriver's point of view, and to answer your question, when you know that you're being fulfilled is you don't have that desire, you don't have that need, you don't have that must, I guess is the better way to put it. You don't have that must, you don't have that need where I have to go accomplish this next big major goal. You're, you feel completely satisfied with where you're at. You're happy, you're content, you're filled. Now that does not mean your desire doesn't go away. That does not mean you still want to accomplish more, but you are content and fulfilled with where you're at today. And there's not that need to have to go do more. I've heard this phrase, um, content, but never satisfied. Do you think that that is an accurate? Um... Mm, for me personally, no, because I think you, you there is a place to be satisfied. You want to be satisfied. If I, if I, if I use that rule and definition, then when, do, when am I allowed to be satisfied? Mm -hmm. To me, that's going back to being achiever. I'm going to have to achieve how many goals? What do I have to achieve before I'm allowed to be satisfied? See, for, for, if you're fulfilled and you're content, I'm satisfied. Like I'm, I'm satisfied with my life right now. I'm very happy with my life. I have no quote unquote need to have to go do anything other than what I feel like doing or what I want to do, right? Yeah. So. Well, before we get into the acronym, um, have you achieved your seven continents in 50 states? I, we, have, we have traveled to all seven continents. I've traveled to 46 of the 50 states. Uh, we would have completed all 50, but COVID actually 
you know, stop that for a few years. But we are leaving on July the 2nd. We're going on a 30-day road trip. And when I come back on August the 1st, I will have accomplished with a road trip through all 50 states. So ask me again on August the 1st, and I can answer that question is absolutely yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. All right, let's 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 jump into the, the acronym. Uh, how do we understand how to live a life of a thriver? Okay, so again, this is just a basic operating system, and THRIVE is an acronym. So step one is you got to take ownership and control. Now, I'll just give a, I'll just go through all six of them, and then we can go in as depth as we want into each six or, or, however, or whichever direction you want to go. So step one is you got to take ownership and control. You, that's the basic foundation. You can't do anything to you take ownership and control. For example, you got to take control of your business. You got to take control of your time. And there's about 15 other things you got to take control of. So that's yeah. the first step. The second step is you got to enter your inner honor your inner compass. And what that means is that you got to separate your ego from what it is that you really want. Because when you're an achiever and everyone around you, society, TV, all your friends, your family, everything you've learned, and your ego tells you this is what you want. But for most people, that's not really what they want. What they really want, you have to pull out of them. So there's specific exercises that I use to help people to actually pull out what they really want. And then that's honoring your inner compass, which comes from your heart. And then step three, then you got to raise and develop next level skills. Uh, wherever you are at today, whatever skills you have today will not get you to where you need to be. It just won't. It's I, I like to use the analogy of a, of a baseball player. You know, when you're first starting out to play baseball, if you're in you know first grade or something and your goal is to become a major leaguer, you're going to have to develop skills along the way. And if you don't, then you're going to get stuck at a certain level. And I think most people get stuck at a certain level. And the reason they get stuck there is they stop developing those skills. So they, they're focusing on achieving goals rather than developing their skills. So that's step three. Step four is you got to implement the proper strategies. And there's different techniques and different strategies uh, that you can use depending upon what it is that you're trying to accomplish in what area of your life. So health is a little different than business and business is different than relationships. So you got to make sure you have the right strategy for the right part of your life. Step number five is then you got to create consistency. Uh, and you do that with systems and habits, which is my background and my, my area of expertise. So you try to systemize and make everything a habit. Uh, the more you can get on autopilot, uh, the analogy I like to use for that is like everybody, at least I'm hoping everybody, brushed their teeth this morning. And I'm guessing that when you brushed your teeth this morning, you didn't even think about it. And the reason you didn't think about it, because it just happens. In fact, while you're brushing your teeth, you're probably thinking about other things and you didn't even realize you just brushed your teeth. Well, if you can do that with a lot of other things in your life, how much simpler would it be? How much more success would you have if you could automate all of that in your life? And you can do that with a lot of stuff with your health, with your relationships, with your friends. You can automate a lot of that. I know that sounds crazy, but you can where it just happens and you don't even think about it. And then last but not least, a step one second. Hold, hold on a second. So I was following the acronym and that should be V. What's my... It is vig well, it's vigorously, sorry, vigorously create consistency with 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 systems and habits. Sorry, sorry, I forgot the word vigorously. <laughs> so you are correct. <laughs> good, good catch. Okay. <laughs> and, and last but not least, step number six is you have to evaluate, <laughs> measure, and track what you control. So you have to track everything, and you gotta you gotta only track and measure what it is that you can control. A lot of people track and measure the wrong things, especially if you're an achiever. They've been trained to track the wrong things. An analogy that I like to use to a 60 second point so everybody can relate is that when people are trying to deal with their health, they automatically want to go to their weight. Okay, the weight is a horrible thing to track and to use as a guideline for your health. It's the absolute one of the worst things you can do. You do not have control over what percentage of, of water your body is containing. You don't, There's a lot of things you don't have control over. So the worst thing you can do is track your weight. So throw that damn scale out. And there's a lot of other things that are much better to track if you want your health. Very good. I just put in the chat all of the five. I put T-H-R-I-V-E, and I hope I got them right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that way you guys can you know think through those as we begin to ask questions. Um, and feel free to put your, your questions in the chat. So Greg, um, let's start with the T um, because it seems like these are linear right like it seems like to a degree you really need to start with the t before you get to a place of vigorously systemizing and creating habits right like 
right. um, that if you don't have ownership, if you're not taking ownership. And so l- l- let's talk about that for a second. You know, like I've read Jocko Willink's book on extreme ownership and this concept of just like own your space and own your own problems. And is that is that what you're talking about? Are you talking about like um, just, you know, and does this does this take into consideration all the crap that we've dealt with in our lives and the the bad things that have happened to us? And I mean, like, what, what does it mean to truly take ownership? OK, so, well, technically, it's take ownership and control. So there is this, it's a dual okay. part. So, but for for the take ownership part of it, uh, all of us have crap in our background, right? All of us, we think we're well, we are unique, but all of us think that our crap is worse than everybody else's crap. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? Nobody understands us because they didn't go through what we went through. Well, we don't understand them because we don't understand what they went through. So, all of us have things that we go through, and so we can either sit there and accept those things and allow that to determine who we are. Or we can step forward and say, you know what, that's not who I am today. That's that was predetermined by my parents or by my friends or by school or by teachers or whatever. So part of what you're saying, as far as taking ownership, you're right. That is, you got to take ownership of everything. It's like everything that you've done to this point in your life has gotten you to here. You got to own that. And when things go bad, like like for example, you know, my dad was was a was in the uh, Air Force. And I really wasn't a son. I was his cadet. I never heard the words, I love you. I never got a hug. I never saw or heard any of that from my father, right? And so for years, I used that. And I didn't realize or understand I was doing it. I was using that as that was my motivation to achieve. And I'm going to prove him that I, you know, I am somebody and I deserve to be recognized. I deserve to be loved or whatever. So part of taking ownership is understanding that, you know, my dad was doing the best that he could with his background. And so I can't allow that to determine who I am or who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. So taking ownership is like, okay, he did the best he could. And he, and, and I, I went through what I went through. So, but I'm not going to allow that to control who I am today. And then that's when the take control part is. And there's certain things that you can learn. There's techniques as far as, okay, now I can take control of the situation and and turn it so now it's a benefit rather than a negative. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, when you're taking ownership, you know, and yes, bad stuff happens to every single person, right? Yep. Uh, and you're trying to do your best to take ownership. Um I think sometimes it does, and you know, it's like it becomes the focal point of your life and it's not even intentional. It's like the subconscious focal point of your life. Like you were saying, like, I'm trying to achieve, but I'm trying to achieve to prove to my dad that I'm good enough or whatever. And it's like, and most people, I don't even know that they know what they're trying to accomplish, right? Like, so how do you get to the place where you know, is it just saying like, you know what, I'm just going to own where I'm at in life? Or do we have to go back and do some work to determine what it is that we're trying to get to or what we're trying, like, what is the cause of that achievement desire? And this comes back to where the six steps kind of work together. So yes, they are linear, but at the same time, they work together. There's some skills. So jump into step number three, there's some skills that you can develop that allows you to have a better opportunity to go back and discover and determine those things. So uh, you know, the first step is obviously just the desire to go back and look at it and trying to discover who you are as an individual and why you do what you do. Most people don't even get to that point. Most people, to your point, they're on autopilot, just like I was for many years. They're on autopilot, just trying to achieve, achieve, achieve. And they don't even understand why. They just think that's the way it's supposed to be done because that's how everybody else is doing it. And that's what I was taught. And this feels right. And this is what I'm doing, right? And you don't even understand that underneath all that is that drive where you're trying to prove something. You didn't even realize you were doing that. So the first step is is just trying to discover who you are and understanding who you are behind the background. So I guess that would be the first step. And then the second step would be there's skills that you can develop. For example, like the skill of self-awareness. You know, that skill is such an underrated skill. You got to have when you develop that skill and it is a skill. So you have to constantly practice it. When you develop that skill, then you can not only reflect back for the rest of your life, but you can reflect on a minute to minute basis throughout the day. And you're going to catch yourself and you don't realize how much of your day is already on autopilot. But now you're going to be able to if you if you've developed that skill, you're going to. Oh, OK, I know I know why I said that or I know why I thought that. 
And instead of being driven by those thoughts or being driven by those statements, now you can react to it accordingly and say, I'm not going to allow that to affect me. And I'm going to go do this instead. Yeah. So I, um, I, I do just a comment on that. It's like, I feel like most people are emotionally and physically unaware of how the world even perceives them, right? Like not, not only they're unaware of, you know, their own issues, their own problems, what actually drives them, what's underneath the crust, you know, but it's like, I think they also are just unaware of how people perceive them, um, which I think is, is a great first step, right? Like self-awareness is, is very, very important, right? It's like, um, because, you know, in order to thrive, I assume, uh, that, uh, it takes a lot of internal work. Um, next question for you is that really, um, as I'm kind of going down this path of thriving, right? Like I want to thrive. Um, do you have to master it in every area of your life? Like I see you on social media and you're doing, you know, date nights with Kim and, but you're also achieving success in your business life. Do you think that you have to do all of this in every area of your life or do you do it in one and then it naturally just starts to take hold in the rest? Uh, well, that's going to depend upon you. Is it possible to do everything in your life? Yes, it is. And that's the difference between an achiever and a thriver. So here's the thing. Achievers don't believe that can be done and they're absolutely 100% correct. They can't do it because they don't have the operating system to do it properly. See, what happens is their operating system is this big wheel. So I got to achieve a goal. I got to do everything I can to accomplish it. I got to make all those sacrifices and I got to do everything. If that's the operating system you're operating on, there's no chance that you're going to be able to thrive in every area of your life. In fact, when you separate the survivors, the achievers and the thrivers, the survivors usually don't excel in any area of their life. They just have a good. The achievers are able to usually thrive in one or no more than two areas of the life. And it doesn't have to be financially. You can have bodybuilders that are thriving in that. You can have, you know, so, but usually they only thrive in one or two areas because that's their operating system. And there's no chance that they're ever going to thrive in the rest of the, in the other areas of their life because they can't do it with that operating system. That's why I introduced the new operating system because with this operating system, you can thrive in every area at the same time because it's a matter of putting your effective and efficiency, putting it together creating that extreme productivity. And when you use this six steps, you can absolutely, in fact, it's shocking to me how quickly someone can change their life the minute they change their operating system. It happened for me and I've helped many others do it as well at this point. And it's literally almost overnight. I know that sounds crazy, but it literally is because what happens is, is that you stop thinking one way, you start thinking another way and this whole world just opens up to you. Things become much easier. And a lot of it comes back to if you follow the six steps, for example, like date night, you know, if you want a better relationship, majority that you start with more time, you got to spend more quality time that I mean, there's literally a hundred other things that I can list. But the first thing I do is you start with time, you got to have quality time. So you can build that into your schedule very easy, literally from day one. I mean, usually I can fix someone's relationship or drastically improve the relationship within 30 to 45 days. It's literally that fast. Uh, same thing with their health. Now, their health won't drastically change in 30 days, but you can put the systems in place where they're in the direction where their health is going to change faster than they actually think is possible. So to answer your question, is it possible to thrive in every area? Absolutely. But of course, it's your life. You get to determine what you want to thrive in. I choose, I want to thrive in every area of my life. You, you uh, allude to the fact that your life changed drastically, right? Like you went from like one area to the other. And, and earlier you talked a lot about, you know, when you went through, you know, the, the difficulty of 2008 through 2009, all of that type of stuff. Uh, wh what changed? I mean, like how, what was Greg 1.0 versus Greg 2.0 now? Like what, what is the change that you experienced? Okay. So the way that process worked is that. Again, that day when I realized that my life was a freaking mess and I didn't want to go through that anymore, I didn't want to make any sacrifice, is that, that literally became a motto in my life. No sacrifice, no regret, no sacrifice, no regret. So probably from about 2011 to 2014 or 15, I would literally say that almost every single day of my life, no sacrifice, no regret. So as I was learning to go through this process, I, I was no clue what these six steps were. I had no idea about any of this. I'm just trying to figure it out myself. I'm trying to find other people I could copy. All I knew, well, the only thing I knew is that I did not want to go do what I already did. 
And I did not want to follow all these other achievers because I knew there had to be a bigger way. Because here's the thing. The other challenging uh, thing about this is that everybody in the world that we listen to, most of them are achievers. They run the world. They really do. They're running all the masterminds. They're running all the groups. They're running all the conferences. They're running... They, they write all the books, they're, they're all the speakers, they're all the gurus. And so all we see or hear is that way of doing things because they're the ones out there. A thriver's not out there doing it because they're not willing to sacrifice their life to do that, right? So, I mean, they may be here and there a little bit, but they're not out there going crazy, you know, working 100 hours a, a week to make all that happen. Achievers are. So it's really hard, even for me after doing this for years, it's hard for me when I go to a mastermind or go to a conference and I listen to people talk up there and it's like they're achieving, you know, I, I just did 300 deals or whatever. And I'm like, oh man, I could so kick his butt. I, I could so do that. But then I was like, that's when the self-awareness kicks in. I was like, oh, that's just my ego talking. I don't need to do that. Why do I need to do that? You know, I'm content with my life. I'm happy with my life. I'm not going to do that. And so that's part of the reason why it's so difficult is, is because of that. And I, I know I went down on a tangent there, but I wanted to express how difficult it, 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 this actually is. So when I was going through that process, I was struggling at first trying to figure it out because I was going to all the same conferences and all I kept hearing was the same thing. You do this, you achieve, you set goals, you do whatever it takes to accomplish them. And you go through this whole process. So I was doing my best to stay away from that and trying to learn and discover and I ultimately came up with these six steps, probably somewhere around 2015 or 16, I think is when I was looking back and saying, okay, what am I actually having success with? What is working? And I pinpointed it down to these six steps. And I said, well, what happens if I just focus on these six steps? So that's when I really started focusing on these six steps and started honing in on them it was around that time. And then I'm, you've known me since 2016. So you saw what happened between 2016 and 2019. I mean, literally... I mean, my entire life changed. I mean, uh, my relationship, we got, uh, we re renewed our vows. Uh, we, I mean, I, I, my entire life changed. That's all I can say is I went from sacrificing everything to working 100 hours a week to now, even when we were broke, we were still traveling. Uh, we traveled the world, uh, got better relationships, uh, got better health until I got diagnosed with mold, but that's a whole nother story. And mm -hmm. just my business took off. It just everything seemed to take off all at the same time. And I attribute a hundred percent to these six steps. Yeah, very good. Um, as I'm kind of listening to you, um, you know, it 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 sounds like um, just simply speaking, you're happier, right? Like you, you actually are just really enjoying life to the fullest. And I think to me, that's to the achievers, right? And I would say that I probably lean towards the achiever side for sure. You know, it's like you, I love to work. It's part of who I am, right? It's my, my DNA, but it's like, but in the end, it's like, what you're saying is, is I still am driven. I'm still able to succeed. I'm still able to build a business. I'm still able to have a good relationship. I'm still able to travel the world but I'm happy, right? Like I'm, I found joy in doing all of those things. Is that the true byproduct of the six steps? It, it, it's like, yes, you get to achieve, but is it that you get to achieve with happiness and fulfillment and joy? Yeah, I think that's the end result. I think the the six steps is really the process how to get there. I right. think the joy, I think where it really starts kicking in is when you realize what you're achieving in each area of your life. You know, because I know as an achiever, and I can I can speak to this because I was an achiever so many years, is that you have this vision that I'm going to achieve all these goals for this someday life, right? We have this vision that someday I'm going to have this life that I absolutely love. And that's what you're chasing, right? You're not chasing necessarily just the goals. You're chasing that, well, when I accomplish this goal, then I'm going to have a better relationship. Or when I accomplish that goal, I'm going to have a better house. When I accomplish that goal, I'm going to have, then I'll focus on my health. Then I'll really be, then I'll be able to hire a personal trainer and they come work out with me five days a week. And then I'm really going to pound out my health and I'm going to take care of it then, right? So we're always focused on the someday life. Well, the difference between my life then and what it is now is I'm living my someday life, right? I'm not looking to fixing my health 10 years down the road. My health is great right now. So uh, I'm not looking to, okay, I'll make up, I'll make it up with my wife five years from now, once I achieve these goals, when we have the money, when we have more money to do so, and then I'll take her on this crazy trip around the world. And then she'll, she'll be so happy and understand why we did all this, right? No, it's like, we're doing it now as we grow our businesses. And I think that's another important thing to, to point out is a lot of achievers in their mindset, 
And again, I was there, so I understand this. They think that they have to sacrifice their business or they have to sacrifice their financial success in order to achieve all this other stuff. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You can actually still grow your business. You can still achieve the financial success, but you just don't have to do it in the way you're doing it. You can do it in a way where you can actually have success in the other areas of your life at the simultaneously. How important is delayed gratification? You know, it's like um, you you have chosen, um, I, I you know, obviously I, I've known you for a while now and you don't live extravagantly, right? Like you're not out there buying Ferraris and doing crazy stuff. I mean, the most extravagant thing I see in your life is travel, right? Like you guys go on the craziest vacations and you're doing the most wild things. Um, how, how important is delayed gratification in this process where I'm, you know, I'm building my business, but I also got to keep up with the Joneses and make sure that I look like everybody else is building my business and on social media. And like, is that a part of this process? Uh, well, I won't say you have to have delayed gratification, but you have to be in touch with what it is that you really want. Yeah. I think it comes back to step number two, which is honoring your inner compass. Uh, there was a time before I had to file for bankruptcy. You know, Kim and I, we lived in a 4,000 square foot house. We had a super nice house. We had maids. We did have a trainer come to our house. We we had all that stuff. We had the nice fancy cars. And so I understand that. I was there. But when I actually just got in touch with my heart, what is it that I really want? It's like, that's not what I really wanted. Those are all just materialistic things. Now, don't get me wrong. I still desire some of that. And we still, I mean, we still bought a nice car. I still have a nice car, but I, I don't have a need for those things. Mm -hmm. So what I have a need for is to enjoy my life and do the things I want to do and enjoy. So for example, like we love to travel. So that's our thing. We love to travel. Now, if you're into cars, then buy all the cars you want because that's your thing, right? So I think that I don't necessarily agree with the delayed gratification. Uh, because Maybe it's pointing it's, it directly at the things that are most important. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. You just got to get in touch with what is really important. So you're not just doing it just to do it. So yeah. like to me, uh, having the biggest house in the, in the neighborhood or whatever is not that important to me anymore. I would rather go spend time with my friends and family and have a great time. I mean, we're leaving tomorrow morning. We're going on a cruise tomorrow morning. We're flying out to uh, oh, Seattle and catching an Alaska cruise. We've been to Alaska already. But this one's special because what we did is like her dad has never been to Alaska and it's his dream place to go. And he's 82 and obviously, you know, health issues. So we are taking her dad and stepmom on this cruise for a week. And we decided to open up to all of our friends and family and all that. So we have like 20, 25 people going on the cruise and I'm going to have a great time. In the meantime, while I'm there having a great time, my business is still growing. Right. So it's like, and that's the kind of life I want to live. And that's what's important to me is that I get to go spend time with friends and family. I'm living my someday life. The life I was envisioning for 20 years trying to achieve, I'm actually having the opportunity to live now. In this process, um, are you helping them map out their someday life? I mean, because my someday life might look radically different than your someday life. Absolutely. Yeah. So and do I help them map it out? I'm not helping them map it out. I help them map it out themselves mm -hmm. because it's really in here. It's yeah. really, it comes from within. That's the thing is I can't tell you what your someday life looks like. I can tell you what your ego someday life looks like because they're all very similar because your ego is talking, right? So, but when it comes from your heart, it's completely different and everybody's going to, some people, you know, they want to change the world. You know, that's great. Some people, they want to, you know, spend time with their friends and family. There are other people that want to, you know, it, it, everybody's different. So it's just going to depend on what it is that's in here that you really, truly want. Unfortunately, the sad part is most people don't know what they really, truly want because they're listening to their ego and to everybody else around them. And that's one of the most liberating things when I went through this process myself personally, is that I was chasing the fancy cars and the fancy houses and all the greatest, you know, keeping up with the Joneses stuff because I thought that's what I wanted. But no, that was my ego talking. What I really wanted was freedom. Mm -hmm. That's what I really want. I want freedom. So when I wake up in the morning, I can do whatever it is that I want to do. If I, if I want to go work, I can go work. If I want to do this, I can go do that. And I don't want money to be an issue. So that was another one of my my things that my heart is like, I don't want money to be an issue. If I want to go on a cruise and take a family, take my family with me, then that's what we're going to do. Right. So but it's different for everybody. I um, I've heard you say speaking on these topics in the past, um, 
you you've mentioned something and I, I don't remember the exact words you used, but it was something like most people believe that in order to get to this someday life, it's going to be this very, very painful process. You got to go through suffering to get there. And you kind of juxtapose this concept that it's like, it's really not about suffering to get there, that you can actually thrive today through the process to get there. And it's like so much of what we hear on social media is like, well, if I would just get up, I got up at six, but if I would have got up at 5.30 a.m., if I, you know, if I, I got five workouts in this week, but if I would have got seven, you know, it's like, if I would have been, you know, it's just like, it, I think that most of us, um, you know, I, I, I was listening to David Goggins yesterday and David's just telling everybody like that basically the path to success is massive suffering. Just suffer more than the guy next to you and you'll get there. <laughs> While I believe in the hard work ethic, I mean, I think it takes hard work to get there. Right. Um, you kind of go opposite of the suffering concept, right? Absolutely. Why do you need to suffer for 10, 20, 30 years? When does suffering end? When are you allowed to enjoy your life? See, that's just the mindset of an achiever. Yeah. They, they've been brainwashed and taught just like I was is that you have to suffer. You have to embrace the suck, right? You have to get through it and you just do it. But what happens is they'll get through it, but then they set new goals and then they got to get through it again. Then they set new goals and they get through it again. You know, when they usually get off that suck is usually when they get old and die or they get a major health issue that really, or some drastic, something drastic happens in their life. Like thankfully it happened to me. Mine was a bankruptcy that woke me up. Thankfully, when I was 44 rather than when I was 64, right? So I, I completely disagree with that. So I would I would have a debate with him as far as that's not the right way to do things. <laughs> In my opinion, uh, yeah. I used to do that. Don't get me wrong. I did that for years. Yeah. Uh, I sacrificed everything because I was, I was told to do that. But I would never do that today. I wouldn't even think about it. I think it's, you know, it goes back to what you were talking about, that just self-awareness. I think oftentimes we just don't feel worthy of, of the success. And so then we punish ourselves versus living in the success, right? It's like, we feel like maybe we shouldn't be happy. You know, it's like, we got to take the hard path so that it feels real, you know? Um, right. I've often said that, you know, uh, you take somebody who's actually worked hard, honed his craft and found success they're not afraid of losing everything because they know what it takes to get back, right? You you get somebody that gets to success easy and it kind of happens on accident. You know, they're, a tick, they're TikTok famous. It's like they're living terrified because they have no idea how to get to success, right? right. And I think a lot of us, we don't we don't know how what got us to success. So we just keep punishing ourselves thinking, well, if I just stay under the load, maybe that's where my success is coming from, right? And it's like, you take this complete 180 turn on that concept. Right. And again, not to keep harping it, but I think a lot of it comes back to knowing what, who, what your inner compass is. Yeah. So if you don't know your success, you don't know the definition of success, you're constantly chasing it. You're re reinventing your definition of success every time you set a new goal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if anybody has any, I know Greg and I've just been going at it. I've been asking all the questions. If you have any questions you want to add to the chat, I'll, I'll definitely uh, pass them along to Greg. But um, Greg, one of the big last questions that I have um, is where does purpose fit in all this? Because, you know, it's like a lot of times you'll hear people talk about until you know your purpose in life, you're never going to actually feel uh, successful until you're living inside of your purpose or what you've cr been created to be or whatever it is. It's like, um, I think that it's, uh, it's, you know, it's so drilled into our heads. It's like, um, where does that fit in? All right, so I, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here with the, with the whole purpose thing. I think people make too big of a deal out of this, and they make it too complicated. And I think it's because it's mostly achievers that are talking about it or teaching it, because they make it like this big grand thing that you have to discover what it is that your purpose is in life. And it's like this mission to discover what your purpose is. The purpose isn't something that you discover what it is. Your purpose isn't something you create. But in my opinion, a purpose is something that's already within you. Mm -hmm. And that may change as you grow and as you mature, that can change. So again, it's about getting in touch with who you are and what you want. And that purpose comes from within. It could be something as simple as for some people to be, I just want to be the best parent I could be. That right. could be that could be their purpose right now. And then when the kids move out of the house, their purpose can change. Now mm -hmm. I want to be, you know, whatever. So uh, to me, purpose isn't this grand thing that you have to go searching for and you go on a two-week vacation and sit on a beach and discover, why am I here on life? 
you know, why, why am I here on this earth? That's not what purpose is about. The purpose to me is about, you know, one of the best ways to determine what it is that you really want, uh, one of the secrets is, is to face your mortality. That's really the biggest secret there is. When people face their mortality, suddenly your ego disappears. If you were told right now that you only had 30 days to live, anything that was driven by ego doesn't matter anymore, right? The only thing that matters is, okay, right then and there, you're going to know what's most important to you in, in that moment because you're going to say, oh, my God, I got 30 days to live. What do I want to do in the next 30 days, right? Yeah. Suddenly, getting a new fancy car when I achieve this goal in two weeks, you don't really care about, right? That goal is just I don't give a crap about that goal anymore. What do I really want to do? Maybe you want to travel. Maybe you want to visit friends and family. Maybe you want to, you know, set up a nonprofit or and leave leave your money. You know, whatever it is. But when you can answer that question, when you can truly face your mortality and make it emotional, then it's going to come up. That's when you find out what your purpose is, because your purpose is going to. That's what you're going to want to do in those last thirty days. So one of the exercises I do when I go with individuals, I put them in a situation where they have to face their mortality. And then you can decide and determine what it is. It's going to be pulled out of you. What is it that you really want? What is it that you really want financially? What do you really want in a relationship? What do you really want with your health? See, most people, if you're going to die in 30 days, you don't care how much you weigh. You just don't, right? It's not important. But we're told it's important every single day by achievers and everybody else in this world. So why are we worried about our weight? No, what you, what's, health is really more about your vitality and more about you know, your energy levels. And there's skills that you can learn to drastically increase your energy levels. You don't have to go work out five hours a day for the next five days, you know, for the next three years in order to improve your health. You can do a very simple, very easy and small, tiny processes that you put on autopilot into your life every single day. It's 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 a whole different mindset and framework of, of way to think. I always say, because I get that question a lot, um, and obviously I've got the nonprofits and stuff like that, and I get at that question a lot. It's like, how do I find my purpose? Like every 20-year-old, every you know millennial Gen Z, how do I find my purpose? <laughs> and I, I kind of, I agree with you. It's like, I always say, stop, you know, you know, I don't push the ayahuasca journey either, you know, like where they're <laughs> off like searching in the cloud. I, I always push this concept of there's what I call lesser purposes and greater purposes. And it's like, you know, I would say that, you know, just like you and your wife, you've started the nonprofit and, you know, things like that. That's more of like a higher purpose, right? It almost feels like a calling. Um, and yeah, the orphanages and feeding centers, something like that, to me, that's a higher purpose. That's a calling. But I think we disqualify ourselves from those bigger opportunities when we don't just live our lesser purposes, which is being a good dad, being a good spouse, being a good employee, right. being a good boss, right? Like, it's like you almost kind of disqualify yourself if you don't live in the purposes of today and it's like, they're all kind of searching for like, and I, I always ask, you know, every, every one of my employees that come in and ask me, how do I find my purpose? I'm like, well, did you put in a good eight hours today? Like, were you a good employee? You know, like, were you a good friend today? Like, were you a good parent today? Like, because in the end, it's like, I think we miss like, to your point, like there's a lot of purpose, you know, like you get, you know, I, I have three boys and um, I just took one of uh, took one of our, both of them, two of them with me yesterday on a trip. And I, my youngest kind of look up at me with gratitude and thank me for the experience. And it's like, and like that moment, like you feel like I felt better in that moment than I felt feeding 4,000 children last week. Right. Like, it's just like, because sometimes we miss that those purposes, the fulfillment and the little things in life, it's about having a good relationship with your spouse or taking your parents on a cruise to Alaska, right? Like there's purpose in that. And I think that sometimes we, like you said, we just, we make it so big that no one ever feels it, you know? Right. It's almost like it's another goal we have to achieve. We got to, it's this purpose we have to discover that we're going to change the world. It's, it's just achiever language, in my opinion, to create a new goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so good. Uh, a question that came in says, how do you recognize when you're on autopilot, especially if things seem to be going well? Uh, well, believe it or not, as human beings, most of our day is an autopilot already. You just don't realize it. Probably 70% of our days are on autopilot. And I can prove it to you right now in the next 60 seconds. So this morning when you woke up, 
you, you woke up on the same side of the bed that you always sleep on. When you got up, you did went through the same routine that you go through every single morning. When you put your pants on, you either put your right leg or your left leg, but you do it the same way every single day, right? You have the same routine in the morning. If you go, if you go to work, you probably drove the same exact path you drove every single day. If you stopped for coffee, you probably stopped the same coffee shop. If you go to get gas, you probably stopped at the same gas station. When you came home, do you take all your rings off and put them in the same place? Or what do you do? You have routines that's running your life every single day throughout the day. You just don't even realize it. So how do you recognize when you're an autopilot? You don't, that's the beauty of it. So, but if you're self-aware and you develop the self-awareness skill, now you can start looking at the things that you do have an autopilot and you see, is that helping you or hurting you from getting what it is that you actually want? Because I'll guarantee you, no matter how well things are going, there are things that you're probably doing that's preventing you from doing even better, right? And no matter how bad you're doing, there's probably things you're doing that's probably helping, but it's being buried by the things that you're not doing well, right? So the whole idea, and that's part of step number five, is, is, is combining three and five is the skill of self-awareness Combined with number five is taking a look at what it is that you do have an autopilot and what it is that you can put on autopilot that's going to make a drastic difference in your life. So, for example, I'll give you one that I'm personally going through because obviously I'm going through this. I'm still learning every day. I'm still going through these processes. So as as you know, and, and I was diagnosed with mold because of all the houses that we were buying and selling and I got diagnosed with mold and I also had a lot of knee problems uh, and shoulder problems. I had a torn labrum. I had knee problems. I had an ankle problem that I broke a long time ago and had a bunch of scar tissue in it. So for about three or four years, I haven't been able to do anything. But now that I'm doing PRP, and I'm able to work out again now and I'm working doctor's mold. So so in January, I was like, well, I can't go from one extreme to the other. You know, the cheaper side of me was like, okay, I'm going to go work out five days a week, an hour a day. And now I got time management issues. I can figure out how I'm going to squeeze this into my schedule. I'm like, no, that's the cheaper trying to figure that out. So how, how would a thriver do this? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put something on autopilot that I know that's so simple and so easy that I can do every single day. And it isn't about getting the result today. It's about knowing that if I put this on autopilot, just like brushing my teeth, and I just do this automatically every single day without even having to think about it, then I know that within six months, 12 months, 18 months or whatever, that I'm going to achieve the results because through the consistency. So what I did is I set a goal is, okay, I'm just going to do pushups every day. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a plank and I'm going to do pushups every single day. And it took me literally less than four minutes that first day. I think anybody could work out for four minutes. And what I did is I attached to something else. You want to, when you're, imp, imp, when you're introducing a new uh, system or a new process. You want to attach that to something that you're already doing. So that way you make sure you do it. So I attached it to when I got out of the shower. So when I got out of the shower, then I just quickly, I jumped down by at the time, I think I could do like nine pushups. I know that's horrible, but that's all I could do. And I, I just stopped. It wasn't about getting in shape today. My only thought process was I'm going to do this every single day until this becomes an autopilot. I don't even think about it. Well, fast forward now, it's now June 6th. And a couple of things. One is I can easily do 50 push-ups in my sleep now. And I just jump down, do, 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 do. But more importantly is now I've been able to anchor some other health things to that. So now it's growing. So now I'm doing some other things. And just today when I was packing for our for our ship, now my entire life, I'm in two weeks, I'll be 58. So my entire life, I've either worn small or I've worn medium. For the first time in my life, I can't wear small. And most of my medium shirts are now tight on me. I'm literally going to throw out half of my wardrobe. And all I've done is less than a five to 10 minute workout since January. So in six months, I know I'm not measuring myself because I don't care the whole concept of being a thriver. All I'm trying to do is I understand the concept is all I have to do is create one small, tiny little step and just do it every single day. Put it on autopilot. Don't even think about it. And boom, one day you wake up and you have all these results and you don't even realize it. That's how simple it is. It's great. We are just about out of time. Uh, for anybody else that wants to know more about your system, how to actually uh, understand the operating system, get in kind of in control of their own life and take this direction, how do they find uh, more out about this? Uh, the best way is just go to my website, gregslaughter.com. So there's some free stuff they can look at. It's got the six steps right there on the front page. They can look at them. Uh, so just go to gregslaughter.com and they can go check out anything and everything that they want. Very cool. I put it in the chat there. Uh, so did Kat. Um, and that way, uh, if you guys want to click there, you can go there and 
I know uh, Greg's willing to work with anybody that uh, wants to get to that place. And I think, you know, for for uh, a, a lifetime achiever like me, uh, this is, you know, obviously something that we're all working towards. And uh, so, Greg, I appreciate all that you do for the community. Thanks for bringing this content to to us today. And uh, and for all of you that will watch it, uh, maybe not live today, but you're going to watch it in the future. Uh, feel free to get in touch with Greg. I know this is Greg's purpose. For you, this is really where you're focusing your life for the next period of time. Correct? Yes, I mean, I still have, I still have, I still have rentals. I still have my uh, property management business, and actually, I just stepped that up, ironically, uh, because we decided there were some some other things I wanted to do, and to do that, I needed to up my my income. So I was like, okay, I'm going to put some effort into this business. So I'm growing that business at the same time. But this is my passion. My passion, who I am truly at my heart is helping other people. That's just who I am. I will bend over backwards, help other people. And I just, this allows me the opportunity to do that. And there is no greater feeling in my life than when I can change someone's life. I it just like, it just, it's an incredible feeling that I can't put a dollar amount to. I just, it's just, you know, kind of like when you, when you're helping um, with your, with your um, uh, um, nonprofit, this is this is my passion. This I absolutely love changing people's life, especially when I can see them go from how I went from achiever to thriver. When I can help other people do that, and they see that they can do this, there's no greater feeling in my life than that. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Greg. Appreciate it. Uh, if you're out there, uh, I would highly, highly encourage you uh, to jump on gregslaughter.com and uh, take the journey with Greg. Uh, for us, this is uh, this is something that we all struggle with, right? It's you want to get off the hamster wheel. You want to get to a place where you're finding joy and happiness uh, in the effort in your life. Uh, and you deserve it. You deserve to have a great life. You deserve to have the things you want. Uh, and I'm excited for Greg to help you along the journey. Thanks, Greg, so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Think thank Realty, uh, for being a part. And thank you for all the Think Realty Plus members. We appreciate you. And we'll see you on the next webinar.